And it's now 48 minutes past the hour. Deciding where to put your money, never easy, especially when the experts can't even agree about what is and what is not a good investment. Take the bond market, for example. Here's more from Steve Crowley. Watching the money we've invested is fun when we're making money, not so much fun when we're not. One thing we should always keep tabs on are interest rates, especially when we've bought interest-paying mutual funds. In 1986, as rates went lower, bond mutual funds were doing great. So well, we put a record $255 billion into these funds. Many of us even took our savings out of the bank. Risk? Well, we could earn 8, 9, even 10% on our money. Today, we're learning the hard way. Higher rates mean more risk. Inflation is making some inroads. Interest rates have been climbing. So many bonds have been dropping in value. Bond funds are at the bottom of the best performing list so far this year. Why? What happened? Because as interest rates rise, the value of bond funds declines. Bill Donahue is a bond fund expert who claims we should avoid them. And indeed, interest rates are rising. That means you will lose more and more each day as interest rates rise. People should get out of bond funds, get out of Ginnie Mae funds, get out of government-insured bond funds. Pretty harsh words, but here's what Donahue means. Say we put $1,000 into a bond fund earning 10%. As interest rates go up, the value of bond funds can drop. Now, we may still earn the $100 that year, but the value of the shares we own in the fund can go down, too, let's say by $80. Our total return would be only $20, or 2%. As long as we understand how income mutual funds work, we can keep tabs on prices, spread our money around, and spread our risk somewhere between the safer and the riskier funds. And if you're worried about the money you've got in bond funds, well, it's not all bad news, because not everyone agrees with Bill Donahue. Newsletter publisher Glenn Parker says, find funds that invest in shorter term, high quality bonds. Yes, there are still good returns in the relatively short maturities. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is if you buy intermediate and short term bond funds, you're gonna have some small fluctuations in both directions in your net asset value as the market goes through its various swings. Can't take all these fluctuations and move some or all of your money into a money market fund or back into the bank where you can earn from five to seven percent. One safe route for the faint of heart. Or you can look at dropping prices as just more buying opportunities in bond funds. I'll tell you more about investing in bond mutual funds. Just write me, Steve Crowley's Money Reports, P.O. Box 550, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33302. And please include your self-addressed stamped envelope. The important thing is to read all these little statements that mutual funds send out. It's the fine print that tells the story. Always the case. Steve, thanks very much. It's 51 minutes after the hour. You should get out your pencils. Joel Siegel will have his summer movie preview after this. Seven minutes before eight. It's almost summer, and that means that's the time of the year when young people are out of school and in the movie theaters. So it's Hollywood's biggest season, of course. And Joel Siegel's here with a look at what we'll be watching this summer. Joel? <laughs> Joan, even though summer doesn't officially begin for three weeks, Hollywood has already has its first summertime smash hit, Beverly Hills Cop to $65 million worth of tickets. And Hollywood already has its first huge flop. Ishtar, it turns out, is Arabic for Howard the Duck. So far, it hasn't paid back Warren Beatty's salary. But this is a preview of some of what I hope will be the best of the rest, starting out with the one surefire, no question, summertime hit. I I Snow White will be re-released this summer on its 50th birthday, July 17th. When it first came out in 1937, they told Walt Disney, you may not be sleepy, sneezy, doc, happy, grumpy, or bashful, but you sure are dopey. Who's gonna watch a 90-minute cartoon? Snow White went on to become the most watched motion picture of all time and to live happily ever after. Another birthday, another sequel. Superman is 50 this year and Christopher Reeve is back in Superman 4. So is Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor. Another birthday, another sequel. The Living Daylight starring Timothy Dalton as... Bond, James Bond. 25 this year, billed as the most dangerous Bond ever. And no more birthdays, but more sequels anyway. Benji is back. An actual summer movie for kids. What won't they think of next? In The Running Man, Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a convicted killer who literally wins the right to run for his life on a game show. The host, Richard Dawson. Good answer. Schwarzenegger has two movies out this summer. This is The Predator. And the good news is Arnold has been taking acting lessons. 
The bad news is he's been taking them from Dolph Lundgren, who stars in the live-action Masters of the Universe. More action, Jim Belushi and John Ritter in Real Men. You want the good news first or the bad news? Give me the bad news. There's no way out of here alive. What's the good news? It doesn't look like we're going to be here long. Inner space, Dennis Quaid gets miniaturized. He's going to be injected into this bunny rabbit. He gets injected into Martin Short by mistake. Produced, ready, by Steven Spielberg. More big names. Robert De Niro plays Al Capone. Kevin Costner is Elliot Ness in The Untouchables. Just the facts, ma'am. Okay, Dragnet. Only the names have been changed. To Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks. I found the snake. On June 26th, the results of that movie. But first, Steve Martin is a modern-day Cyrano in Roxanne. And the witches of Eastwick, Susan Sarandon, Cher, and Michelle Pfeiffer conjure up the devil. And guess who shows up? Just your average horny little devil. And in Spaceballs, Mel Brooks does to Star Wars what Blazing Saddles did to the Old West. Rick Moranis plays Dark Helmet. I can't breathe in this thing! Brooks plays yogurt. Don't make a fuss. I'm just plain yogurt. And Daphne Zuniga is the princess. Daughter of Roland, king of the druids. Funny. She doesn't look druish. <laughs> I thought she did. That was John Candy in Star Wars. That character was Jabba the Hutt. Here he's Pizza the Hutt. And the saying is, may the Schwartz be with you. And if the Schwartz is with Hollywood, they could have their best year ever. But you know what they say, some are movies and some aren't. But don't worry, I'll be here all summer long to let you know which is which. Could be a lot of good stuff for uh, kids, they always look, though, yeah, yeah, they always look that way yeah. in 30-second snips, but it looks great, it does. <laughs> Until you get a hold of them. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. We'll be back with more right after this from Howard Johnson. In our next hour, the Beatles producer, George Martin. And tomorrow, Peter O'Toole. Woke up, fell out of bed, tried to comb across my head. Found the way downstairs and drank a cup. And looking up, I noticed I was late. It has been exactly 20 years since that song and this album has, and four guys called the Beatles, made rock and roll history. In this half hour, we will look back at Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band two decades later, if you can believe that. You got a free album here? No, there's nothing in it. See, uh, this? Yeah. <laughs> Just a prop. That's the way it works in television. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joan London. <laughs> and I'm Charles Gibson. It's Tuesday, June 2nd. Nice to have you with us this morning. Also, in this half hour, we're going to be talking about the controversy over President Reagan's suggestion a few days ago that millions of people be required to take an AIDS test this half hour, the AIDS test, how it works, what it does, and how you feel about it. We'll also be talking with two people who say Elvis Presley was the father of a daughter he never met, never knew he had. Right now, down in Washington, Edie Magnus has the news. Edie, how are you? Just fine. How are you, Charlie? Okay. Good morning to you and Joan. Good morning. And good morning, everyone. Some 6,000 AIDS researchers from around the world are meeting for a second day here in Washington, where they hope the public focus will be more on science than on politics. Today, they are talking about heterosexual transmission of AIDS and the chances for finding a vaccine. Yesterday, politics was dominant. Outside the White House, 64 activists, many of them AIDS victims, were taken into custody and police wore yellow rubber gloves while making the arrests. At the AIDS conference, Vice President Bush Thank called for expanding gentlemen. testing for AIDS. And like President Reagan the day before, Bush was booed. Thank you. We made the decision that there must be more testing. And as the president said last night, the federal government will soon require testing for prisoners, immigrants, and aliens seeking permanent res residence. Free speech, that's what it's all about. After his speech, the vice president reacted. In case you had trouble hearing that, what the vice president asked was, who was that anyway, a gay group? It was a remark that observers later suggested was insensitive. West Germany's governing coalition has agreed to endorse the U.S.-Soviet plan to eliminate short- and medium-range missiles from Europe. The West German agreement removes a major potential barrier to progress at the arms reduction talks in Geneva. The Iran-Contra hearings resume this morning with Assistant Secretary of State Elliot Abrams on the witness stand. Abrams is expected to be sharply questioned about apparent contradictions in his testimony on secret U.S. efforts to resupply Nicaraguan Contras. 
Also on Capitol Hill, Admiral David Rogers will brief the Senate Armed Services Committee in closed session about his investigation of the attack on the USS Stark. The House today is expected to pass a bill compelling President Reagan to inform Congress about the U.S.'s growing involvement in the Persian Gulf. And as Kenneth Walker reports, President Reagan says the U.S. should not have to patrol the Gulf alone. President Reagan served notice on U.S. allies that he wants some offer of help for his decision to secure the flow of oil through the Persian Gulf. Yet the American people are aware that it is not our interests alone that are being protected. The dependence of our allies on the flow of oil from that area is no secret. In remarks made honoring General George C. Marshall, the author of Europe's post-war reconstruction plan, the president indicated he'll press for allied support at the economic summit in Venice, to which Mr. Reagan travels tomorrow. During the upcoming summit in Venice, we'll be discussing the common security interests shared by the Western democracies in the Persian Gulf. The future belongs to the brave. Free men should not cower before such challenges, and they should not expect to stand alone. When Secretary of Defense Weinberger made a similar appeal to NATO last week, Allied reaction was cool to the idea. Unique among the Allies, Britain's Margaret Thatcher has offered to consider any plea for U.S. help. Other Europeans are said to feel the maritime risks in the Persian Gulf are not on the rise, despite the recent attack on the USS Stark. The Allies are also concerned that President Reagan may be spoiling for a fight with Iran. Kenneth Walker, ABC News, the White House. Fire officials in California say a campfire started by young people was the cause of a devastating blaze in Pebble Beach. Fifty-six homes were damaged or destroyed in the brush fire Sunday night. Damage estimated at $16 million. Some 200 residents were evacuated. Checking today's news calendar, a House subcommittee will question Dennis Levine about insider trading that led to his conviction and the scandal on Wall Street. The famous garbage barge is back in the news today. A New York state court will consider whether the town of Islip will be allowed to expand its dump and take in the garbage. The Boston Celtics and the Los Angeles Lakers play game one of the NBA Finals tonight in Los Angeles. And this evening on World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, a report on how some Americans are translating the Bible into a mysterious language called Gullah. Finally, the sad story of one man's efforts that weren't enough. Chris Bury reports on an idealistic philanthropist who single-handedly tried to save his tiny town of Antler, North Dakota, then watched his dream slowly die. The place they call the Pride of the Prairie is a hard-scrabble farm town down the road from Canada. Like many dying farm communities, Antler's biggest export is youth. Only 15 school children remained this year. Last month, they rode the bus together for the last time. It's kind of sad to see the bus come in this morning, because you know it'll be the last time we'll be here. Kind of sad. Uh, yeah, it was kind of sad. Sad because Antler's only school just closed forever, despite a farmer's six-year fight to save it. In 1981, Bud Kistner offered free land up to nine acres to couples with children who'd moved to Antler. And I have to give it to somebody. And where could I give it? Uh, better than to my own community. Get children in here to keep our school. Yeah, it's worth a try. Homesteaders came from Colorado, West Virginia, Michigan. Six families with a couple dozen children signed up for Bud Kistner's offer. Free land if they would stay for five years. We were excited. We really were. At that time, we thought of coming over here, up here and being totally self-sufficient. We were going to live off the land. But Barbara Ellis's family may have to leave the land soon. The others have already left their homes and abandoned their dreams. Even free land couldn't keep people like Lynn Price in a barren place where jobs are scarce. It's just bleak. Uh, there's just no work available. With just 12 students expected next year, Antler can no longer afford its school. For these children, that's a hard lesson in economics. There's no jobs around for the parents to get money to supply the kids with food, with pencils, with school clothes. So another country school has faded away. One more ghost town is forming on the prairie. Chris Bury, ABC News, Antler, North Dakota. And that's our news. Joan, Spencer, doesn't that story just break your heart? We were just sitting here saying, so we just can't believe that. Yeah.
It's yeah. very heartbreaking. And to hear the kids express the sentiment they express, that's really sad. Yeah. Edie, thank you. Uh, right now, it's, uh, what is it? It's eight minutes after eight. <laughs> on this Tuesday morning. <laughs> on this Tuesday morning. Well, the weather's actually getting a little bit better, though. Not bad. Some of your messes are clearing up. That's right. <laughs> my, my messes, right? Your messes. Uh, I'll take credit for the clearing up, okay? <laughs> the satellite uh, pictures from overnight show very clearly uh, where the clouds are. Uh, what we've got here is some clouds in the upper Mississippi Valley. Look at this cold front pushing through here. Watch it form up there and a and, uh, little tight uh, ball of clouds there. Storms in this area in the upper Mississippi Valley and the Great Lakes. We've got clouds hanging around the northeast that will produce some rainfall, but most of the remainder of the nation is under clear skies today. Now, we do have some severe weather. We might point out to you what's going on here. First of all, in the uh, southern New England and New York State area, there's going to be some rather heavy rain today. We already have lightning and thunder flashing around this area in New York right now. But the most severe weather will be these storms here in the upper Mississippi Valley that will produce uh, strong winds, tornadoes, hailstones, and here's what's happening right now. We've got clouds moving in to that region, and the areas that are most likely to be affected today are Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, Chicago, Indianapolis, Detroit. They will all see these powerful storms, mainly in the afternoon. That's a look at the national weather picture. Here's what's happening in your hometown area. This is Channel 12 meteorologist Phil Erickson. For Providence and vicinity, we'll have a mixture of clouds and some sun today, with scattered showers and thunderstorms likely, high near 80 degrees. Partly to mostly cloudy tonight, partly sunny tomorrow, with a chance of a shower, high in the middle 70s. One final look at today's weather in the next half hour. Joan? Thank you, Spencer. Right now it's nine minutes after eight. And if, it, and if all of you who mm. watch late night, huh? <laughs> Let me start again. All of you who watch okay. late night television should get ready for even more changes. Chantal has a story in Hollywood. Chantal? Good morning, Joan, and good morning to you, America. You'll be seeing less of tonight's show host Johnny Carson next season as he turns over one night a week to comedian Jay Leno when Carson is on vacation. Both Leno and comedian Gary Shandling will share the guest hosting chores. They are the first permanent guest hosts that Carson has had since the departure of Joan Rivers last year. And with the onslaught of summer films almost upon us, you can look for several of your favorite rock stars on the big screen. Madonna will hopefully wipe out the memory of her last film, Shanghai Surprise, with her new feature, Who's That Girl? Look for Frankie Avalon and Annette Funicello in Back to the Beach, an homage to their 60s beach movies. I remember those. And in one of the most unusual movie combos in recent history, Ralph Bellamy teams up with the Fat Boys, a popular rap group in The Disorderlies, a Three Stooges type comedy. One widely anticipated film about music is La Bamba, the story of Latin rocker Richie Valens, who died in a plane crash at the age of 17. No big names in the film, but word is it's one to look for. And there's another film we're hearing a lot about in Hollywood. Its working title is Blood on the Moon, based on the novel by James Elroy, though when it's released it may have a different title. Shot on the streets of Los Angeles, it stars Oscar nominee James Woods, Word is, it's a controversial movie and not for the squeamish. And though the studios are keeping rather hush-hush about it, James Woods recently told me this much. Well, it's about a male chauvinist cop who's investigating a serial murderer who kills feminists. So I thought that might be kind of fun for me to work on for a while. I can grind a few axes in the middle of the story, you know what I mean? And die-hard Rambo fans will be delighted to know Rambo 3 is very much in progress. There was much speculation as to where that film was to be shot, considering everything from the right look to the safety of the cast and crew. But who better to ask about this than Rambo himself, Sylvester Stallone? They've spent a fortune finding the location. It's almost $4 million searching the world for the right location. And they've zeroed in. And it will start around the beginning of September. And, and since it's dealing with a very, very weighty subject, we're trying to give it as much time to really mature before we jump right into it. And you might be wondering what this $4 million search turned up. It appears that Rambo 3 will be shot in Israel. Until tomorrow in Hollywood, I'm Chantal. Thank you, Chantal. It's 12 minutes after the hour. All this week's controversy about AIDS testing is taking place in the setting of a major scientific conference on the disease. Our medical editor, Dr. Tim Johnson, is attending the third international conference on AIDS, and he joins us now from Washington. Good morning, Dr. Johnson. Good morning, Charlie. Let me talk for a moment about, because all the controversy is around the AIDS test. What is it? How hard is it to take? What does it show you? The current test uh, is a blood test. <clears throat> that looks for antibodies to the virus. It does not detect the virus itself, 
but looks for antibodies, which are evidence that you have at some point in the past been infected with the virus. The test is done actually at a two-stage level. The first test is a screening test that is very sensitive, but unfortunately, because it is so sensitive, can produce a lot of false positives. That is saying you have the antibodies when in fact you don't. So automatically today, a second test is done to weed out those false positives to confirm the positive result. That's called the Western blot test. Those two taken together, and they can be done in a matter of days or certainly at the most weeks for a cost of less than $100, will give a very accurate result. That is whether or not you have the antibodies. It doesn't tell for sure how much virus is in the blood or how infective you are. It certainly does not tell whether or not you have actual clinical symptoms. Well, that's what always confuses me. If you have the antibodies, you've been exposed to AIDS, but but you don't necessarily have it. But if you have the antibodies, you can develop the disease, correct? Yes. What we have learned, of course, is that a very significant percent of people who test positive for the antibodies will go on to develop the actual disease. The best figures reported yesterday uh, from a study of San Francisco gay men is that over a period of about seven or eight years, 35 percent of them who test positive have developed AIDS, and that figure is expected to rise as time goes on. Any surprises in this conference? No real surprises, although there was a lot of attention paid uh, to the announcement by Dr. Gallo, the co-discoverer of the AIDS virus, of a new form of that virus, and there have been other forms of the virus. That shouldn't confuse us or the public because there's only one real AIDS virus in terms of the danger now being caused. A lot of work being reported on attempts at vaccines. Uh, I don't think the public should interpret that to mean that a vaccine is right around the corner. Everybody I talked to off camera yesterday suggested that we have many years of hard work yet before we can talk about a vaccine. This uh, conference itself, does it become sort of a media event? I guess it does. Well, <clears throat> it's been reported that there was one media person for every four or five scientists, and I was <clears throat> absolutely amazed sitting there in this huge hall to see the hordes of media. I'm not accustomed to covering big <laughs> conventions of the sort. You are, of course, in the political arena. Uh, so yesterday, I think it was m almost as much a media event, particularly because of all the controversy about testing. But the program is chuck full of all kinds of important scientific reports. And I think as the week goes on, it will become more scientific and less media and political. Dr. Tim Johnson, thanks for being with us this Thank morning. Thank you, Charlie. We, as we mentioned earlier this morning, would like your opinion. Would you personally submit to an AIDS test? If your answer is yes, you could call 1-900-220-2322. And if you wouldn't, the number is 1-900-220-2344. The phone lines are going to be open until 2 p.m. New York time. We'll have the results for you tomorrow. By the way, the phone company will charge you half a buck for the call. Fifteen minutes after, Sergeant Pepper's birthday after this. It was 20 years ago this week that the Beatles taught the world to play with the release of their album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. It has sold over 15 million copies since June of 1967. It's still going strong, and it's just been released on CD. George Martin is widely acknowledged as the fifth Beatle. He produced Sgt. Pepper's. Ben Fong Torres was a senior editor of Rolling Stone and currently writes for the San Francisco Chronicle. George Martin told us how the album was born. It actually started with Strawberry Fields. Strawberry Fields was the beginning of it. Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane were to have been on the album, but I took them off to make a single, so we didn't put it on the album. Um, and it was only later that Paul came up with a song called Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band. And uh, I guess the idea stemmed from that song originally, because he wanted to have a kind of fictitious band, which was really the Beatles, playing a, a fictitious concert. And when it came to writing a song for Ringo, which was obligatory, we always had to have a vehicle for him, uh, Paul came up with a, little, with a little help from my friends, and that was Ringo became Billy Shears. So <laughs> that, that became a kind of theme thing. So it kind of grew from that. It, was, it wasn't any pre-planned uh, uh, concept at all. It really changed the music industry. Why don't you put it in, in historical perspective, why it was then and now such an important album? Not only did, did they uh, show what could be done with um, creativity in the studio, taking, using basically a four-track machine and, and coming out with what sounded like at least 48 tracks, 
of technology, they were the first group that felt that free to experiment in the studio. They seemed to be the first group that had that kind of artistic control. And so in a way, they, they paved the way. They came up with what was later called the concept album. And that, again, opened the doors for a lot of musicians, many of them not ready to go that route. And so we got um, flooded with a lot of what ca got called art rock later on. Many of the musicians saying that they uh, got uh, their inspiration through Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So it changed the industry and other musicians, technically, socially, musically, and in terms of attitude toward the business. So in other words, the artists had more control instead of the record company, and also the fact that an album wasn't just a lot of singles strung together right. anymore. It was an actual That's album right. and sold as that as it had an importance. George, what about outside the music industry? Just uh, what kind of an impact do you think that this had on society as a whole? Uh, well, I think the Beatles had an impact on society generally during the 60s, undoubtedly. They, they were an expression of youth. Um, they were, the, for the first time, the youth of the, of the world had a, a kind of focal point to, to focus on. And they, they were kicking over the traces for them. So I, I guess that they were quite a large influence there. Um, it's interesting talking about what you were just saying about the, the way that the album was created, because I think that the important thing is that we would treating the recording medium as something in its own right. Before then, we tended to make records as performances, in a, recordings of performances, so that uh, a group would be able to do a thing in live. And for the first time, we were concentrating on some, some, something you couldn't do live. We were creating a piece of, uh, of, of plastic that uh, was something special. Are you in contact with any of them? Could you tell us what they think of this album now, having a little distance from it 20 years? I think they think the same about it as they ever did. You know, it hasn't really changed. Um, I chatted to Paul about the CD, and he loves it. He likes compact disc anyway. And I'm sure George does, although I haven't, he hasn't actually heard it when I spoke to him. Um, but, you know, the music's still there. I don't think they've dwelt on it like other people have, nor, nor have I. I've, you know, I hadn't heard it for a while until I was asked to look at it for compact disc. And so it's been coming back to an old friend for me. Well, we might say, will we still be playing this album when it's 64? <laughs> <laughs> or when I'm 64. <laughs> ben? Oh, I think so. I think people, I think we'll see this album being played in the turn of, next, in turn of the century and beyond. Ben, I think uh, you'd agree with that, that it'll, it'll I, last. I think it's, yes, I think it stands as good entertainment. You know, it really wasn't, um, and one, re one of the reasons it'll live for a long time, at least till it's 64 and ready for retirement, is that it wasn't confined to rock and roll. It was a bit of all kinds of music, and that was another way the Beatles showed us that the parameters of rock and roll could be expanded. Well, right. it's fun today to look back at something that changed music history and history in general. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us. The results of that movie. But first, Steve Martin is a modern-day Cyrano in Roxanne. And the witches of Eastwick, Susan Sarandon, Cher, and Michelle Pfeiffer conjure up the devil. And guess who shows up? Just your average horny little devil. And in Spaceballs, Mel Brooks does to Star Wars what Blazing Saddles did to the Old West. Rick Moranis plays Dark Helmet. I can't breathe in this thing! Brooks plays Yogurt. Don't make a fuss. I'm just plain yogurt. And Daphne Zuniga is the princess. Daughter of Roland, king of the druids. Funny. She doesn't look druish. I thought she did. That was John Candy in Star Wars. That character was Jabba the Hutt. Here he's Pizza the Hutt. And the saying is, may the Schwartz be with you. And if the Schwartz is with Hollywood, they could have their best year ever. But you know what they say, summer movies and some aren't. But don't worry, I'll be here all summer long to let you know which is which. Could be a lot of good stuff for uh, kids. They always, look, though, yeah, yeah. they always look that way yeah. in 30-second snips, but it looks great. It does. <laughs> Until you get a hold of them. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. We'll be back with more right after this from Howard Johnson. In our next hour, the Beatles producer, George Martin. And tomorrow, Peter O'Toole. Woke up, fell out of bed, tried to go. Dollars into a bond fund earning 10%. As interest rates go up, the value of bond funds can drop. Now, we may still earn the $100 that year, but the value of the shares we own in the fund can go down, too. Let's say by $80. 
our total return would be only $20, or 2%. As long as we understand how income mutual funds work, we can keep tabs on prices, spread our money around, and spread our risk somewhere between the safer and the riskier funds. And if you're worried about the money you've got in bond funds, well, it's not all bad news, because not everyone agrees with Bill Donahue. Newsletter publisher Glenn Parker says, find funds that invest in shorter term, high quality bonds. Yes, there are still good returns in the relatively short maturities. I mean, the worst thing that can happen is if you buy intermediate and short term bond funds, you're gonna have some small fluctuations in both directions in your net asset value as the market goes through its various swings. Can't take all these fluctuations and move some or all of your money into a money market fund or back into the bank where you can earn from five to 7%. One safe route for the faint of heart. Or you can look at dropping prices as just more buying opportunities in bond funds. I'll tell you more about investing in bond mutual funds. Just write me, Steve Crowley's Money Reports, P.O. Box 550, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, 33302. And please include your self-addressed stamped envelope. The important thing is to read all these little statements that mutual funds send out. It's the fine print that tells the story. Always the case, Steve. Thanks. And it's now 48 minutes past the hour. Deciding where to put your money, never easy, especially when the experts can't even agree about what is and what is not a good investment. Take the bond market, for example. Here's more from Steve Crowley. Watching the money we've invested is fun when we're making money, not so much fun when we're not. One thing we should always keep tabs on are interest rates, especially when we've bought interest-paying mutual funds. In 1986, as rates went lower, bond mutual funds were doing great. So well, we put a record $255 billion into these funds. Many of us even took our savings out of the bank. Risk? Well, we could earn 8, 9, even 10% on our money. Today, we're learning the hard way. Higher rates mean more risk. Inflation is making some inroads. Interest rates have been climbing. So many bonds have been dropping in value. Bond funds are at the bottom of the best performing list so far this year. Why? What happened? Because as interest rates rise, the value of bond funds declines. Bill Donahue is a bond fund expert who claims we should avoid them. And indeed, interest rates are rising. That means you will lose more and more each day as interest rates rise. People should get out of bond funds, get out of Ginnie Mae funds, get out of government-insured bond funds. Pretty harsh words, but here's what Donahue means. Say we put 1,000... Christopher Reeve is back in Superman 4. So is Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor. Another birthday, another sequel. The Living Daylight starring Timothy Dalton as... Bond. James Bond. 25 this year, billed as the most dangerous Bond ever. And no more birthdays, but more sequels anyway. Benji is back. An actual summer movie for kids. What won't they think of next? In The Running Man, Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a convicted killer who literally wins the right to run for his life on a game show. The host... Richard Dawson, good answer. Schwarzenegger has two movies out this summer. This is The Predator, and the good news is Arnold has been taking acting lessons. The bad news is he's been taking them from Dolph Lundgren, who stars in the live-action Masters of the Universe. More action, Jim Belushi and John Ritter in Real Men. You want the good news first or the bad news? Give me the bad news. There's no way out of here alive. What's the good news? It doesn't look like we're going to be here long. Inner space, Dennis Quaid gets miniaturized. He's going to be injected into this bunny rabbit. He gets injected into Martin Short by mistake. Produced, ready, by Steven Spielberg. More big names. Robert De Niro plays Al Capone. Kevin Costner is Elliot Ness in The Untouchables. Just the facts, ma'am. Okay, Ragnet. Only the names have been changed. To Dan Aykroyd and Tom Hanks. I found the snake. On June 26th, very much. It's 51 minutes after the hour. You should get out your pencils. Joel Siegel will have his summer movie preview after this. Seven minutes before eight. It's almost summer, and that means that's the time of the year when young people are out of school and in the movie theaters. So it's Hollywood's biggest season, of course. And Joel Siegel's here with a look at what we'll be watching this summer. Joel? <laughs> Joan, even though summer doesn't officially begin for three weeks, Hollywood has already has its first summertime smash hit, Beverly Hills Cop to $65 million worth of tickets. And Hollywood already has its first huge flop.
Ishtar, it turns out, is Arabic for Howard the Duck. So far, it hasn't paid back Warren Beatty's salary. But this is a preview of some of what I hope will be the best of the rest, starting out with the one surefire, no question, summertime hit. Hi -ho, hi -ho. Snow White will be re-released this summer on its 50th birthday, July 17th. When it first came out in 1937, they told Walt Disney, you may not be sleepy, sneezy, doc, happy, grumpy, or bashful, but you sure are dopey. Who's going to watch a 90-minute cartoon? Snow White went on to become the most watched motion picture of all time and to live happily ever after. Another birthday, another sequel. Superman is 50 this year and Christmas.